we'll get started. So I just want to first acknowledge um, that for those of us who are uh, joining from Halifax, that we are, you know, here together virtually, but gathered in Chibuktuk on the um, ancestral and current land, the unceded land of the Mi'kmaq. Um, and I know that other people may be coming from other locations as well, but I wanna thank um, and acknowledge the, the care and the space given to us to be able to do this work here in Mi'kmaq um, tonight. So, um, and I wanna thank all of you for joining us on a, on a cool and rainy spring day. Um, and I'm really excited to, to have this series start up again. Um, my name is Kim Fry, and I'm the Efficiency Coordinator at the Ecology Action Center. Um, still feeling pretty new to this position, but excited uh, to highlight some of the work that I have been doing with the Faithful Footprints program and with Stephen Collette, who's one of our speakers. So Stephen's going to start tonight. And then um, after he speaks, we're going to hear from Spencer LeBlanc and Spencer works with Efficiency Nova Scotia. And then we'll have a chance for some Q&A and discussion. Um, uh, you can ask them some questions and we can strategize together. So thank you to everybody who's introducing themselves in the chat. Um, we've got David Lewis from Central United in Moncton. We've got Anne-Marie Dalton, who is um, very involved in the United Church and also on the board for the Ecology Action Center. We've got Wayne Lynch from St. Matthews United in Halifax. And we've got Eleanor Reynolds um, and hopefully other people can introduce themselves as the evening goes on. I am going to um, pass the floor over to Stephen. And so Stephen can uh, give us a little bit um, of a, an introduction about himself and the work that he does both with the Faithful Footprints program and with his own business and talk to us about the program and some of the achievements that the program has had and some of the work he's done. He knows so much about churches. I always learn a ton whenever I'm in a meeting or um, in a seminar with Stephen. Super fun to work with and I cannot wait to meet him in person. Um, Stephen, I'll let you go. Thank you very much, Kim. Welcome, everyone. Uh, appreciate everyone taking the time out of their busy schedules and uh, daily lives to be here today. Uh, certainly want to hope that uh, we make it worth your while. So feel free to uh, put questions in the chat, whether you're watching uh, via Zoom or via Facebook Live. We will um, uh, answer those questions. I'm going to sort of blather on for a bit first and uh, Spencer will talk and then we'll go through some questions for you. So uh, first off, I work with an organization called Faith in the Common Good, uh, link in the chat. We are a multi-faith national nonprofit started by the former moderator, Bill Phipps, over 20 years ago. And those who know uh, Bill Phipps know that he passed away last month. It's a loss to, uh, to a, large a large congregation of people coast to coast. Faith in the Common Good, we are multi-faith. Um, we work with all all denominations, all faiths, um, and trying to make that connection between the environment and uh, their actions, their worship, and their buildings. So I am the uh, building manager. I'm a building scientist and a sustainable building consultant and a heritage professional specializing in faith community buildings. So I'm a nerd of nerds when it comes to buildings, and that's my job. So I like to help people and their congregations uh, make better choices, make better decisions uh, to help save the energy, help reduce our carbon footprint and to save money, um, which means that can be rolled back into more missions. So uh, we've worked coast to coast um, through these programs and through different programs over the years and with the services that we offer. Uh, one of the services uh, that we're currently, programs that we're currently delivering is called the Faithful Footprints Program. Uh, that's in the chat now there for you. <clears throat> the Faithful Footprints Program is for United Churches and United Church of Canada properties. Um, and it's an interesting one because it's a real exemplar program. Uh, any United Church property can access up to $20,000 in grant money to do energy efficiency actions. 
And you can even access an additional $10,000 up to a maximum of 30 if you were decarbonizing, which means if you were getting rid of uh, an oil burning appliance, a fuel burning appliance of any kind in your building, you can actually uh, get up to $30,000 in grant money, which is really amazing. And even better than that <clears throat> is, well, you have to put some money on the table. And for every dollar you put on the table, the United Church will put two. So it's a one-third, two-third grant, which is great. But your component can actually come from other organizations, such as Efficiency Nova Scotia. So the goodness that Spencer is going to be talking about shortly actually is leverageable. So you're allowed to double dip for the United Church uh, properties and access the money from uh, Efficiency Nova Scotia and then use that as your contribution to get more free money from United Church of Canada to do more action. And it's a really remarkable program. So um, we've got uh, Baptist here as well. Um, that's great. This program is interesting because it's the first of its kind that we've done at this scale. Uh, we have had other programs where we've delivered for the United Church, for the Anglican Church. We've worked with the Mennonite congregations. We work with a variety of others coast to coast. But this one's really interesting in how it um, is really trying to walk the talk. <clears throat> you know, the United Church of Canada is trying to make that difference. And... Um, and they're doing it with money. They have that capital because of how their the, the financial model and business model works for the United Church. Um, it's difficult with different uh, other structures, uh, bureaucratic structures as to who owns the buildings and stuff. But ultimately, everyone can make, it, make an action within their own congregational space and make a difference. Um, now, I happen to be English, Irish, French, and Scotch, and that means I have all the cheap covered, um, and it means I'm here to save you some money. So let's start with some resources. In the chat, um, Faith in the Common Good has a bunch of resources, so some toolkits, some guidebooks that are free, free downloads, PDF. Um, the two uh, on this page. Page the first two um, are really my favorites. The do-it-yourself energy audit guidebook. That's a free download. It actually came from Manitoba Hydro, and they let us use it and modify it and make it look pretty and readable and fix some of their typos. Um, but what I like about that is the first two thirds are written in human, not nerd. They're actually like, what's a heat pump? You know, why are solar panels worthwhile? Or why should I think about LED lights? And a real explainer sort of piece. And the value of that is it's something you can take to your board table, you know, especially if you're here because you're, you're on the building committee or, you know, you're on the green team and you want to be doing some actions. This is like, okay, folks who may not know about the other people at the board, that may not be your strength. And so the first two thirds of that book really written for that conversation. So really help you. Here's what we want to do. Here's what it is. And everyone's like, oh, that makes sense. And that's a really helpful tool. The last third has a walkthrough, a do-it-yourself checklist, which is great. So, you know, that can help you do an inventory instead of set yourself on a path and it's free. The other workbook there is the Energy Star Action Workbook for Congregations. We're the only organization partnering with the US EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, with Energy Star. Um, and so we have a great workbook. It is a bit more American, um, but it offers some really great resources. So um, some things to keep in mind. Um, more links, I'm just keep putting them in the chat so it's all helpful for folks. Um, we do all also offer uh, building audits. So um, we don't do energy audits specifically. So that's not a requirement for what Spencer is gonna talk about. Um, but we do offer services where you can start with a free, do it yourself, because it's free. But if you want something more, some eyes on the building, we offer virtual green audit. And so that would be delivered by myself or a colleague. And then we would actually um, <clears throat> walk through your building via Zoom, because we're all kind of used to using Zoom. And um, you would show me stuff, and I would tell you stuff, and you would show me more stuff, and I would make some recommendations. And you would actually get a copy of that video. And that's about, uh, we charge $100 an hour, um, and probably take a typical building uh, 
it wouldn't take more than two and a half hours because honestly i'd probably just be barfing longer than that with you walking around moving your camera um, and your battery will probably die anyway so typically it's about two hours or less um, and that's a hundred dollars an hour and like i said you get a copy of the zoom report and a one-page summary of recommendations we do also in person green audits and the green audit sort of is really comprehensive we do look at energy because it's important we're also looking at air quality and food and water and waste and maintenance and marketing and rental agreements. And so a lot of different things and heritage and religious architecture to help you understand your building and make more, make it a much, make it as um, sustainable in all aspects as possible. So that's a fee for service. And um, I do live in Ontario, sorry. Um, and we would have to uh, work out some costing uh, and have more than one so that you're not paying for that kind of uh, situation, which is easy because Kim and I are working on that sort of setup right now. Um, I want to just quickly show one thing, though. Um, what I want to show is I'm putting in an image in the... Sorry, my net's going to work that way. I want to talk about the idea of where to start your um, actions. Um, the idea of actions is really important. We think when we're thinking about green, we want to start with solar panels, that that's really, you know, what we want to do. And that's what green means. And it can. But typically, when we think about energy efficiency, it's more like a pyramid. And we want to do the really low hanging fruit at the bottom first of that pyramid, the base. That's light bulbs, LEDs, that's timers, that's dimmers, that's motion sensors, that's programmable thermostats. That stuff has the quickest payback. Like for an exit light, for example, changing an exit light from the 40 watt uh, incandescent to an LED, the payback is three months. Like that's remarkably fast. And we're gonna start seeing energy efficiency there and payback money. So it's really easy money to make. Then you're going to start looking at things like appliances and air sealing, your attic hatch. You have the biggest buildings in, in, your, in, your, in your town, in your village, in your city. And with the tall volumes, we have a lot of air leakage out the steeples, at the spires, depending on the architecture. And you could be losing cubic meters of air per minute out your attic hatch in the month of January. It is a tremendous amount. And if you have rondelles in your ceiling, even faster. So these are huge energy loss. It's more important, air sealing for the churches and congregational spaces and faith communities is more important than the insulation oftentimes. So we really wanna think about doing the simple stuff first before we jump to the big ticket items from an energy efficiency perspective. Now, I know Spencer's going to talk about solar panels, and that's awesome. And I don't have a problem with solar panels. I love seeing them. But we want to make sure if you're do, t doing solar panels for, uh, for climate crisis, for uh, marketing, because it's a great marketing tool, um, for social justice and environmental justice, or an investment even, those are all great reasons to put solar panels on. If you're coming to it from a strictly energy efficiency perspective, I want you to make sure that we're not doing that first, that we're getting rid of the 60-year-old uh, oil furnace in the basement first, okay? That's where we should be focusing our, our nickels and dimes first, okay? Um, so that's just, uh, that's just some ideas. Um, but when we think about, when we think about uh, um, looking at the buildings, the air leakage is really important. Um, I say the next thing is probably your fridges and freezers. And most commonly in my experience, you have really old fridges and freezers. Now, I don't know how old, but the green avocado or harvest gold is certainly a probability in my experience. Um, when we think about appliances, uh, white appliances, we want you to understand that Every five years, the energy consumption of a new appliance is halved every five years. That's how rapid the technology is, is improving. So if you're rocking a 15, 20, 25 year old fridge, it's financially killing you. Now I get it, it won't die. You can't kill those old beasts, they work great. But from an energy perspective and a climate perspective and a cost perspective, they're killing you. 
And they were probably donated by someone lovely who cared, who went out and bought a new fridge to match the new kitchen. Um, that's super common. But we find that these can be massive energy hogs, especially if you're operating um, like a larger kitchen or doing food banks uh, with the multiple freezers, stuff like that can be a huge, huge economic impact um, and an environmental impact. So make sure they're disposed safely and properly. And think about Energy Star. We always want to purchase Energy Star appliances. Anything Energy Star is going to be the top 10%, 10, 15 percent of that uh, category. So you're going to get the best bang for your buck, whether that's LED lights, doing that through uh, Efficiency Nova Scotia, or any other, even heat pumps um, can get you, uh, you know, the Energy Star ones are going to be the better performers. So always think about Energy Star appliances, Energy Star anything. The other thing uh, is ceiling fans. Because we have the really large spaces in our sanctuaries, in our worship spaces, um, hot air rises, which um, depending on your building stock, I like, you know, where the where the minister or, you know, is down at the front in the low and everybody's up high because then that hot air can just keep everybody warm. Um, I am kidding. It's a joke. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> Because of the high volume, uh, the large volume space, and because of the tall ceilings, that hot air sits up top. And for those who have been in large worship spaces and have balconies, you know it's always hot up in the balcony. So really large ceiling fans moving that air down will save you tremendous amounts of money. Um, and because it's pushing that heated air down to the thermostat, the thermostat is going to be cycling less, right? And the less it cycles, less energy we're spending. So it is always better to run ceiling fans and always cheaper than it is to run mechanicals. Now, if you do have a balcony and if your thermostat is underneath the balcony, the hot air doesn't rise, which is why people hang out under the balcony because it's always warmer than it is out on the bigger space. Um, I think they're just hiding from the minister, that's all, but uh, <laughs> it's warmer way back there. So a lot of people do that. Um, so always make sure your thermostats are in the right spot. Um, I really like dimmers, timers, motion sensors, um, things like motion sensors in your bathrooms or timers, um, I think can save a lot of money as we're looking at reopening, we're looking at a lot of actions and we're looking at a lot of rentals, hopefully, and very busy congregational spaces post COVID. Everybody needs to gather. We crave it. We need it. We want it. Certainly the church on Sunday, you know, a synagogue on Saturday, mosque on Fridays, um, great. But the rest of the week, we want people to be using the spaces as well. So we're financially sustainable. And so keep that in mind. Um, after events, it's usually the same three or four volunteers walking around, making sure everything's off. Well, if you put timers and motion sensors in different places, like bathrooms, great example, hallways, stairwells, where safe and appropriate, um, you can actually save a lot of money. And volunteer efforts because you know the lights are going to be off right and so now we're doubling down on getting extra value for the humans for the volunteers like yourselves who are here tonight um, to really gain value on that so those are um you know some different things to keep in mind as well um i think when we're looking at decarbonizing so we're sort of moving up the pyramid um we're looking at decarbonizing we want to think about our mechanical systems um Oil furnaces are on the way out. Um, interestingly, I just had a conversation with a church in uh, Quebec, and you must remove oil appliances in Quebec within the next two years. Um, that's a government regulation, which is remarkable. It's a remarkable decision to say no more oil, period. Um, so those kind of conversations are coming, even in you know the land of Irving, it's coming. Um, and so keeping that in mind, thinking about getting off the, the really dirty oil um, and kind of leapfrogging the technologies and getting the heat pumps can be a really remarkable uh, change in efficiency. Um, the question I get a lot is, will heat pumps work in Nova Scotia? And the answer is yes, yes they will. Um, but when it gets really cold, will we freeze to death? No, no, there's a lot of variables. It depends on the proper size, whether you got any insulation or thermal mass, if you're a thermally massive building, that it's done properly and delivered properly. And you get the heat actually pushing down. 
there's a lot of variables. I know one, um, there's a massive uh, church in downtown Charlottetown that's going complete heat pumps. It's like a 20,000 square foot building. So it's definitely possible. And you should have, you know, a definite one or two opinions to make sure that you're going to get that. And, you know, you want an energy star dual stage, um, but it is possible. And if it's, if you're worried about it, you can have electric baseboards as backup. Um, but heat pumps are very, very efficient. And I think just that efficiency, so to wrap your heads around that, an electric baseboard we're all familiar with, one unit of electricity makes about 0.75 units of heat. Okay, it's a toaster, right? It's all electric baseboard is, just toaster, it's resistance. Pardon me, but a heat pump, one unit of electricity makes about four units of heat and about three and a half units of cool. It's remarkably efficient. Like it's crazy, crazy efficient. And so how it works is, you know, minus 10, minus 12, it's still one unit makes four. But then it gets colder outside, it's one unit makes three units of heat, you know, and as it gets colder, one unit makes, you know, two units and one unit. And so when it's, you know, getting down into the mid minus 20s, you know, it, it's, it's struggling, there's no arguing, I'm not going to tell you any different. It's still squeaking out some heat. Um, and below that, when we get, you know, minus 30s and stuff, yeah. And if it's there for a long time, again, depending on sizing, depending on insulation, depending on air sealing, depending on all those details, you might need some supplemental heat for those very, very, very um, extreme temperatures. Again, it depends. There's no black and white answer. There's no off the shelf. Um, but we're not using tremendous amounts of energy that uh, oil furnaces do, like humongous amounts of BTUs um, and energy put into it. And so that's why they're designed to fit the building. So getting an energy audit, getting an engineer, um, having some couple of mechanical contractors give you different opinions, making sure you're making the right decisions, decisions when you're switching to heat pumps. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Um, but they're super awesome. So uh, that's kind of... <clears throat> Uh, the piece as far as low, medium, and high. Um, feel free to put uh, um, some questions in the chat. I'm going to wrap up my piece right now. We are going to have uh, lots of questions, so I'm here to answer them. Um, so if you don't uh, write them down, if you don't want to put them in the chat, we can ask afterwards. But I'm going to pass it back to Kim, who's going to over to Spencer. So thank you all. Thank you, Stephen. And um... I know that Stephen's worked with, I mean, what's the total number of churches that you've helped shepherd through the process, ballpark? Uh, for the Faithful Footprints program, I've worked with 271 congregations coast to coast so far. Yeah, so a real breadth and um, depth of knowledge of, of what's out there. So thank you so much, Stephen. Um, and again, as Stephen said, we'll have time for questions. You can either pop them into the chat. If you're on Facebook, you can um, put them in the comments there. And Rowan, who's our awesome tech support and help, um, will feed them to me. And then we'll also open it up um, afterwards. But next, we're going to hear from Spencer LeBlanc. And Spencer is a business development manager with Efficiency Nova Scotia. And he is uh, one of the um, the development managers who works with the small business rebate program. So he's going to talk to us about what are, well, a bit about Efficiency Nova Scotia, what Efficiency Nova Scotia does. So I think most people know, but a highlight of that and some of the programs um, that have been around for a while, it's new programs that you might consider accessing. So I'm just going to spotlight you, Spencer. Thanks, Kim. Appreciate it. There we go. Thanks so much. I've got a PowerPoint that I'm going to speak to, so I'll just try to um, share my screen now if that works. Let me know if it doesn't. Is that the green button? Sorry, just um, bear with me here for a quick second. Thanks for making the time to join us tonight, and uh, definitely uh, glad to share you know the information we have and uh, support you with our programs. So I'm just sharing my screen now. Can you see that okay, Kim? I can see it. Okay. Perfect. All 
All right, so Efficiency Nova Scotia is um, Canada's first energy efficiency utility. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization and uh, lucky to receive funding from um, Nova Scotia Power as well as uh, the provincial uh, government and federal government. Um, so we're here to help uh, homeowners, businesses, nonprofits, and I'll speak to our support for uh, nonprofits, sacred spaces, and churches uh, tonight. Um, and definitely uh, agree with uh, Stephen that there's there's so much to look at, and there's a lot of uh, kind of um, quicker payback projects, and then there's longer payback projects, and the different motivations, um, you know, for different projects. But I'll be highlighting some of the the programs that uh, we have and, and rebates that we uh, have on offer. So a um, couple exciting things have uh, popped up recently uh, from Efficiency Nova Scotia. So definitely as I'm going over um, some of our offerings, like keep in mind that, uh, um, you know, some of those quicker payback projects like uh, lighting or air sealing or thing or timers or things like that uh, would be what you'd want to start with. But then I'll speak about heat pumps and other things um that uh that we'd like to help you with as well um i'm just gonna see if i can adjust my video can you see my slides okay kim sorry yeah we can i can see them they're not the full screen there we go yeah is it full screen right now it just it shows the next one coming so i think it's showing maybe what's meant to be your version but i think we can all see it's just a little bit smaller Let's see if I can make it a little bit bigger. Okay, well, I might just speak to the slides uh, if I can't make them any larger. Um, so yeah, uh, just recently, last summer actually, we were able to expand our small business nonprofit um, program to support non-electric upgrades. So that would be helping with um, heating upgrades uh, where the existing heat source can be oil, gas, or electric resistance. So previously, we could only help um, churches and sacred spaces that had electric heat. Whereas now, um, and as of last summer, we can help with um, heat pump projects, uh, moving you away from oil or gas or, or what have you. Um, so it's uh, fantastic news and a big uh, development in our programs. Um, and we've been uh, lucky to help quite a few uh, churches and sacred spaces uh, since that program launched. Uh, so I'll speak to a couple examples um, later in the presentation. Um, another recent development uh, was actually just this past Monday, April 25th, uh, we launched um, a program specifically for um, solar PV for nonprofit buildings, and it can support up to $15,000 or 25% of the costs of, um, of a solar installation through pre-approval. So just speaking about our small business program that also supports uh, nonprofit spaces, um, it's open to any uh, building that has um, an average monthly power bill less than $3,800. So that would uh, typically cover any uh, sacred space or church. Um, you know, it's a pretty broad range and, and this program is meant to offer, uh, you know, great support, um, you know, higher than uh, the normal rebates uh, for these spaces. And we can cover up to 80% of the project costs through pre-approved rebates. Um, if the space um, is, um, if the project is covering something where it'll save electricity, then we can help with financing and rebates. Whereas if it's our new side of our programs, uh, you know, helping move away from oil or gas or what have you, then it would just be the rebates. Uh, but um, but we'll definitely look to help you uh, in many ways. And this small business nonprofit program uh, for churches would be uh, helping with um, heat pumps, uh, lighting. Uh, could be water heating upgrades, uh, kitchen equipment if it's commercial grade. Um, so uh, lots of different things, but um, 
as Stephen had mentioned, uh, always best to start with the the projects uh, with the smallest payback and kind of work from there. Um, so uh, look forward to working with you. And I'll next speak about um, the application process just briefly. So um, say you want to uh, work with this on uh, a lighting or a heat pump project. Uh, the process would be to reach out to some uh, contractors and uh, uh, technicians and specialists and and get advice on uh, the upgrades that would uh, support your space and um, and get some quotes and uh, you know kind of uh, work to a point where you have a preferred um, preferred quote or a couple uh, quotes you'd prefer and send them into Efficiency Nova Scotia with a, a rebate application. So that application is called Before You Buy and um, uh, we can get that to you and uh, it gives us helpful information knowing what your existing equipment is, you know, your existing lighting, your existing heating system, and it helps us calculate the predicted energy savings and also the predicted rebate, which as I said, can be up to 80% of the cost. And then um, we'd send out uh, the project report and um, this would be uh, a pre-approval of the project. So it would uh, state that we're interested in, in working with you on the project and offering a certain rebate. So you'll know the exact rebate amount and also the status of the financing. Um, so then uh, you can work with your, your uh, rest of your building committee and decide on the installation and to move ahead. And um, once the project is complete, uh, say it was a heat pump or, or lighting upgrades, um, you'd send us in the final invoice and, uh, and a form to, to let us know how you'd like to be paid out. Um, so fairly straightforward. I just wanted to kind of go over that quickly. Um, the next uh, slide speaks to um, a church located near Greenwood, and uh, they had um, gotten our support uh, for a heating upgrade in the last six months, and uh, the building was heated with an oil forced air furnace. Uh, they worked with uh, some um, installers and had their preferred installer uh, put together a quote, and they got the rebate application into us. Um, for this project in particular, uh, the rebate was uh, around $8,000 and that covered 80% of the, the project cost. So pretty substantial support and really helped them move ahead, um, you know, without having to uh, have a large capital outlay for the project with us covering 80%. Um, so just wanted to kind of highlight that one. Um, another um, case study would be a, a church that we worked with in Westville recently. So um, their existing heating system was an oil boiler and their operating costs uh, for the oil boiler were um, you know, above $20,000 per year. Um, for that project, we were able to provide a rebate uh, for a heat pump upgrade. The rebate uh, was about $37,000 and it covered uh, just under 60% of the project costs. So um, another uh, helpful support in that project moving ahead with this new side of our programs uh, that launched last summer. So um, oftentimes, uh, as Stephen said, there's lots of bits and pieces that make up your energy use, um, but often uh, heating can be the biggest uh, outlay of cost. So some of these projects uh, are providing uh, considerable energy savings and, and that can be used for other um, other developments and, and uh, things for the church. And, and definitely uh, we're here to, you know, offer as much support uh, on the heat pump side of these projects. But uh, as Stephen said, it's uh, really worth looking into the, um, the air loss and insulation and uh, and the state of the building come before you go ahead uh, with one of these projects. But uh, um, but I just wanted to highlight um, some of the recent past projects. So I'm going to next talk about solar PV. So that would be generating um, power uh, for the space. And uh, this is the program that just launched two days ago. Um, it's very similar to a program that we have for homeowners in Nova Scotia. So it's been expanded to include nonprofits, uh, including churches and sacred spaces. And the, the rebate can be up to $15,000 or up to 25% of the uh, pre-tax cost. Um, and for this program that just recently launched, um, it would be working with uh, solar installers and the, your preferred solar installer would submit your application uh, through to us uh, to get pre-approval for your rebate. And you know kind of um, beforehand how much the rebate and, and that kind of thing. Um, so that's a very exciting program that just launched as Stephen said, you know, there's lots of things to consider and lots of great upgrades can be made uh, within the space before you add on uh, solar, but, um, but definitely different motivations and, 
and we're looking to work with you and help you kind of whatever uh, stage your your building is in so you know maybe you've already upgraded the lighting and set up timers and put heat pumps in and then maybe solar is really you know the next step for your space so it's great that this program is launched and has direct support for for nonprofits. So speaking about um, lighting, we do have a free product installation service. So that would be our program in Nova Scotia that uh, we've had for homeowners for many uh, years, and it's been expanded for small businesses and nonprofits. So if there's incandescent bulbs throughout the space, we can come in and upgrade those to LEDs at no charge. If the space is using electric hot water, uh, we would offer um, water saving measures uh, like faucet aerators and uh, tank wraps and that kind of thing. And we have three different partners that can help um, depending on where you're located in the province. So I indicated their information here, but we can get you that information um, offline. But, um, but that program has been uh, kind of expanded beyond homes and, uh, and some spaces have a considerable number of, of incandescent bulbs. So we'd be happy to come in and swap those out for LEDs at no charge. And then, um, you know, the, the other lighting, um, you know, sometimes you have quite a bit of, um, you know, fluorescent lighting, tube lighting, different types of lighting that um, other lighting can go through our small business nonprofit program that I mentioned with the up to 80%. Um, I'll just take a pause for a minute. I see uh, Kim has uh, maybe raised her hand or is it possibly uh, someone else? Um, or should I wait, Kim? I think it might be another one of the kids. Okay, should I hold, so should I, I wait? Keep going and we'll do, okay. we, yeah, people can put their all questions right. in the chat and we'll also have space when you're done. So. Sure, and like I'm keeping this fairly brief and wanted to go over it, uh, you know, with lots of time for questions. So my next slide is actually just wrapping up and uh, and saying, you know, uh, what questions can we help you with? So, um, so myself and Stephen can uh, take questions now and uh, we'll be able to, to chat with you offline as well, but, um, I'll turn it back over to you, Kim, uh, for us to answer questions. Thank you so much, Spencer. And I, it's so exciting to hear just how significant and substantial those programs are in terms of the support that's available. So I hope um, I hope that's new information for some people. And the launch of the solar program is also really exciting that nonprofits will be able to access that. Lots of exciting things, definitely. Yeah. And um, one thing I didn't mention was if a, a church is looking to upgrade to heat pump, they don't have to remove their existing, say, oil or uh, or gas system at the same time. Like if it works, then then definitely. But it's not a requirement. I know in some mm -hmm. cases, you know, financially, they might want to do it in stages, and uh, that's fine with us. So just wanted to kind of put that out there that we want to kind of you know work with the spaces uh, however is going to be best, and and everything's pre approval on our side. So you know, you'll know kind of our support in advance and that kind of thing, so. Awesome. Um, Spencer, can I ask if you're able to the stop share of your oh, um, yes. presentation? I'll just make it easier and I think everyone's faces will then be a little bit bigger. So I'm looking at the chat right now um, and I'm seeing a question from David Lewis that when compact fluorescence first came out, we converted essentially all our churches incandescent lights. Does it make sense to replace the CFLs with LEDs now or wait and replace as the CFLs expire? So from my understanding, you know, there is a significant energy uh, jump going from an incandescent to an LED, but the, the jump from a CFL to an LED isn't, isn't as significant. Um, you know, so it might be a, 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 a situation where um, if that light's not being used very often, like it's in a part of the building where it's not being used very often, maybe, um, you know, you could swap it out with an LED, uh, you know, um, when, um, when that makes sense. But uh, if you're interested in like a broad swap out, uh, you know, we can help and then there are rebates. Um, and, you know, um, um, I don't have all the kind of uh, the breakdown of it in front of me and maybe Steven can jump in if, uh, if he has any advice, but definitely, um, you know, you've already made a big jump going from incandescence to, to CFLs. Uh, so you're already definitely uh, um, in better shape there. I totally agree, Spencer. I think when the most used lights in most faith communities are actually your four foot tubes, right? Because those are going to be your office, your kitchen, your basements, your rental spaces. So you're going to actually have four foot tubes everywhere. So you have the 32 watt 
Um, if you got the most, you know, the T8s, if you got the most efficient bulbs uh, back in the day. Um, and now you're gonna, you can actually just pull those bulbs out and put in LED bulbs. So no need to muck with the, the ballast, uh, none of that anymore. It's plug and play, uh, pop the old ones out, pop the new ones in. And so you'll actually see big savings on those because they're the most used lights. Now the sanctuary lights, you're gonna have uh, compact fluorescence, which is great. Um, <clears throat> I don't personally recommend you switch out sanctuary lights bit by bit because they're gonna look different. And I don't care about disharmony in the, in the bathroom or the kitchen or the office, but in the sanctuary, we definitely don't wanna see disharmony with the different light colors you know, and the, and the warmth. So I definitely recommend doing the lights all at once in the sanctuary but they're your longest payback because they're, they're on the least amount of time within a typical week. So um, keep doing what you're doing, focus on your four foot bulbs and uh, you'll see the savings there for sure. Thanks, Stephen. And I can just um, jump in that for those four foot uh, tubes, we've got our great program to support it. And we can kind of get back to you with the energy savings and the payback and, and the rebate pre-approval. Um, you know, those types of projects are, are um, you know, happening all the time and, uh, and something we would like to work with you on for sure. Great. And you may have answered. So someone did write that um, there's a sanctuary with floodlights in it. These are typically 150 watt. Just wondering if the program covers these types of bulbs. And I think I hear you saying that it does. Um, Yes, definitely. So our program is um, really organized on energy savings. So, you know, if you've got those higher wattage bulbs and then, um, you know, you're proposing a lower wattage uh, LED solution, um, that's where we want to be involved and offer the, the rebate to kind of help you move ahead. And, and so um, definitely, um, you know, if there's energy savings where you're, um, you know, you're dropping to a lower wattage bulb, uh, then uh, we'd like to work with you and, and get some pre-approval uh, organized for the project. Right. Yeah, yeah, the 150 watt bulbs. The other piece with that is your dimmers are going to be uh, actually copper coils inside the uh, inside the dimmer box. Um, it's electric dimmers, and they actually don't save energy. And some of those dimmers on some of your uh, worship spaces have uh, aluminum fins on it, and they're there to dissipate heat so that the box doesn't melt when you dim the light. Um, so it doesn't save you any energy. So with the new LED lights um, that Spencer and the, faith, the Faithful Footprints can help the United Churches, we wanna also um, have uh, thinking about the dimmers um, and uh, in there as well, because they can make a huge difference. Um, and someone just asked the next question. I'm just seeing it. Um, the 400 watt in the gym. Yeah, you can replace those as well. Um, those, they could be halogens. So I assume Spencer for a 400 watt halogen um, in the gym. Uh, I assume that would count. It certainly count for our. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yep. We'd uh, just gather a bit of information, uh, you know, about the usage of the space and, and the current lighting uh, on the rebate application but um, definitely you know we support that and uh, and you know some of those uh, spaces as uh, Stephen mentioned earlier are going to be used even more as things open back up and and you know um, having lower wattage lighting is going to provide energy savings as well as um, often improving the atmosphere uh, by changing the light quality as well yeah yeah that light quality is a really big one a really big one for sure mm -hmm. um I see another question, and I think you covered this, Spencer, but maybe you have some thoughts. So for a church that currently has gas-powered hot water heating, they wouldn't be eligible, right, for the heating program because that's only for electric heat. But do you know of any other programs that might be available or options for a church with the gas-powered hot water heating? Sure. So that's a great question. The expanded program that uh, changed last summer made it eligible. So that is eligible. And um, right now, a church can be heated with literally anything, and we want to help them, you know, upgrade. If they're going from heat pump to heat pump, then, you know, there's not as much uh, energy savings. But, you know, these uh, older spaces that have uh, you know, gas or, 
or oil or, or what have you, those are perfect situations where, you know, you could um, work with some, uh, some technicians and get um, some equipment proposed and, and what have you, but that hundred percent would be a great situation to, uh, to work with this for a rebate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'll jump in. Um, <laughs> uh, Kim, whoever type, obviously everyone's typing in comes up as Kim, which is, which is awesome. Um, <laughs> if you're talking about like uh, hot water radiators, so whoever typed that in, um, just clarify by uh, taking your mute off maybe or typing in the chat or in the q a if you're talking about your hot water tank for your domestic like for your taps oh right or are you talking about you have like a, a boiler system for uh, uh for radiators and uh, so we just want to make sure we're going to get your question uh, properly answered there Boiler system. All right. Thank you for radiators. So um, I'll jump in and then I'll let Spencer jump in. So a couple couple things. Um, typically old masonry, massive, uh, thermally massive uh, buildings really love radiant heat. It's really great for them. It's great for that masonry to stay warm because it acts like a thermal battery and keeps the building warm. So radiant heat is lovely. Um, with the rads <clears throat> from a full efficiency perspective, not just the grant stuff, you can obviously improve to a, to a higher efficiency, uh, gas, uh, boiler system. And one of the things that you want to think about when you're looking at, if you're keeping the rads as gas is you want to think about, um, uh, making sure the lines are actually all clean because they will build up with corrosion over the years and that's going to reduce efficiency. The old valves that are all stuck and have 16 coats of paint from the last 100 years also going to reduce the efficiency. The inability to adjust the heat, right? Because I know you've got some rooms that are sweltering hot and you've got some rooms that are freezing. So actually commissioning the whole system from stem to stern, although it's a massive project and and quite daunting for many, will return massive amounts of energy savings. So you will maximize the savings for that. Now moving to try to post carbon, we can, you can do heat pumps. And what I might suggest without knowing what building you're at, is maybe thinking about heat pumps because it doesn't have to be black and white, all or nothing. You could have heat pumps maybe in the offices and the kitchen and the rentals, right? So maybe you've got a CE wing, like a classic Christian education wing. That would make more sense to switch that. So now we've got heating and cooling. That's making more comfort, comfort, better rentable, and it keeps your administrator happy. Um, I actually truly did have one congregation who were putting heat pumps in so the administrator wouldn't leave because it was too hot in the summer. (laughs) Um, But so you can kind of switch those switch to heat pumps for those areas and then keep the sanctuary on, you know, a single boiler. So maybe you got two and you're going down to one. Um, You can also switch the rads to electric. Now there's a company in uh, there's a company in Quebec, I know for sure, called EcoRad. And they actually take the rads out and restore them and they put an electric coil and fill it with oil, just like those ones we buy from Canadian Tire that we have under our desks. Um, And they actually reinstall them. So from a heritage perspective, keeps them in there, super cool. Um, But, and it's an electric rad. Um, And so that's a really unique uh, opportunity. So it doesn't have to be black and white um, is the point. There are variations and ways to improve efficiency, but I think Spencer's going to tell you that uh, switching to a heat pump, uh, he's probably got good news for you. Yeah. So I'll, I'll just jump in and, you know, definitely if a heat pump is going to be ideal for those offices and admin areas, then we'd be happy to help. If you're um, updating, like say, um, you're going from a really old boiler to a newer high efficiency. We don't have rebates for that situation, but but definitely for those areas where a heat pump would be kind of um, best case, uh, then we do want to help. And and the program expansion that launched last summer um, can help in those areas. So we'd be happy to kind of you know help you with some next steps and uh, and uh, look forward to working with you on that one. Cool, cool. Another uh, question in the chat. Um, yep. Stephen mentioned that every five years, the efficiency of appliances improves by 50%. Uh, 
Is there any type of similar efficiency improvement with heat pumps? Is that technology's efficiency also evolving? Good question, David. I, I, I would say it is. Like at one point, you could only get a single stage heat pump, and now you can get a dual stage heat pump, um, which kind of works exactly like your fridge and freezer do. Your fridge is the single stage, and then your freezer is a double stage to drop that temperature even lower. And so we can get dual stage uh, heat pumps now. Um, and we're actually late to the game. Like heat pumps are everywhere else in the world, except in North America, because we are fascinated with for trying to heat an insulator called air. Um, and so we're late to the game. You know, I was in Greece, you know, 15 years ago, and there were heat pumps for sale in the grocery store. Like we're, we're really behind in Sweden, uh, all Scandinavian countries. It is standard installation on new construction is to put heat pumps in. They don't do anything else. So the technology is out there and the Japanese certainly are, you know, Fujitsu and Mitsubishi make incredible, uh, incredible equipment. So the technology is improving, but not through the leaps and bounds um, really going from the refrigeration cycle to the heat pump cycle was that big step. Now they're really working at trying to get that lower temperature uh, operationally effective. And that and that's where the technology is going. Yep. Cool. Yeah, Canada and its fascination obsession with oil and gas. <laughs> it's, a, it's a problem given the latest IPCC report. It was so bizarre to have that come out and then have the Bay de Nord get approved a week later but uh but yeah that's why all of this work is so incredibly important um I have a question if there's no more questions in the chat I'm wondering um I guess this for you Stephen like you have seen over 200 churches go through the faithful footprints program and then I know other um faith based groups have also done the greening sacred spaces program through faith and the common good are there a couple of examples of, of the work that's been done with this program that it just really stand out and have been exemplary, really inspiring, super dramatic that you could just share with us, like concrete, some concrete examples? Oh, yeah, spot like that. That's excellent. Um, there was one church in um, one church in Toronto, actually, and. Uh, Architecturally, 1930s, uh, very Republican architecture, um, uh, Federalist kind of building um, for the nerds. Uh, they couldn't actually worship in the sanctuary in the summer because it got too hot. Um, and what it turned out was they had the rondelles, the architectural ceiling grates. Um, they had uh, four of them that were uh, six feet in diameter each. Um, and I said, those are air sealed and insulated, aren't they? And they're like, oh yeah, for sure, for sure. And uh, well, I said, well, let's put some money on that and go upstairs. And we went into the attic and they were insulated with a piece of carpet. Um, and they were losing like orders, of, like so much energy uh, out that in the wintertime, but in the summertime, because it was basically a direct path to the roof, the heat from the roof was radiating into the building um so much that it physically drove them out mm -hmm. and so um that's a really classic example of our architecture turning around and biting us and costing us a lot it served a purpose back in the day but it doesn't serve purposes today so the point is we don't our churches and our faith communities are not the same buildings as our homes they kind of are they're just bigger versions but they're not quite they're a different creature, and it's really important to understand how they work and how the energy moves through them in a, in, in a way that can help you make the best decisions possible because they are different creatures, thermally massive for a lot of, now there's lots of stick frame uh, churches through Nova Scotia for sure. So understanding your building is super important so that you're making the best decisions possible. If you're basing your knowledge on what works at your house, it might not work for your church. That's a great point. And not, not even to, um, you know, there's the additional factor of just the heritage aspects of those buildings too. 
in addition to just architecturally how they're so incredibly different. So definitely that's why having um, people like you involved who really understand all those complexities and um, differences, I think is so important. And then I think the piece that connects to home and why it's so exciting to see faith-based buildings taking on this leadership role is that their congregations can be inspired to say, this is happening there. If I haven't done this work in my own home, I'll bring it to there. And, you know, like letting people know about all the home programs for efficiency Nova Scotia in the context of that transformation and a place of worship, I think is really important. So that leadership has been just incredibly fabulous. And, uh, and your leadership has been great too, both Spencer and Stephen. Um, you are both so full of knowledge and, and have shared so many great programs um, that I think will get our participants excited. I wanna thank all of you for joining us. Um, uh, and I hope that you'll, you'll be at our upcoming webinars. We are going to have one about the MOU and the um, plan from Efficiency Nova Scotia in May. And in June, we'll be taking a look at some of the building codes, the new building codes that have um, been announced by the federal government and see how that shakes out here in Nova Scotia with building codes. Um, and I hope that you'll join us for those information. We'll be coming about them soon. Um, thank you, everybody, for, for joining us. And... Uh, look forward to seeing you at the next one. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Spencer. Have a good night, everybody. everybody. Thanks and take Great. care. Thanks very much. Grateful.